Hi, this is Tim Distasio, and this is Combustion Analysis for HVAC Technicians Part 2. As a review, this entire course will consist of very short videos that are designed to teach combustion safety, analysis, diagnosis, and recommended best practices at the HVAC technician level. So we're not going to get heavy into the chemistry or the, the medical aspect of combustion and combustion safety. We're simply going to teach subject matter that is relevant to the technician. So today we're going to talk about carbon monoxide safety. You may ask, why are we talking about carbon monoxide safety when this is a course that's designed to teach how to use a combustion analyzer? Well, that comes later, but carbon monoxide safety is a huge part of what we do as technicians because it's important that we educate not only ourselves, but our customers on the real hazard that comes with carbon monoxide and especially fuel burning equipment that we work on. So carbon monoxide, where can we find it? Well, here is just a short uh, group of pictures that shows where we can find carbon monoxide sources. For example, the top left one here, a car left running in an attached garage. So you may have a home that doesn't have any fuel burning equipment at all. It's an all electric home, but there's still a carbon monoxide hazard there because that car is left idling in an attached garage. Or somebody's power goes out in the wintertime, what do they do? They drag the portable generator into the garage, they turn it on, it runs all night while them, while them and their family are sleeping. Those are real hazards that we need to make sure that our customers are aware of. And of course, we as technicians need to be aware of the hazards that come from fuel burning appliances and equipment that we work on like water heaters, furnaces, boilers, even kitchen equipment that burns uh, fuel, we need to make sure that our customers are aware of that hazard. So what is carbon monoxide or CO? Again, don't get confused with carbon dioxide or CO2. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that can be present whenever you uh, light a fuel like natural gas or propane or oil on fire, like what we do in HVAC equipment. Now, unlike other gases, it's pretty much the same density as air, maybe slightly lighter than air. So it's not really going to rise or sink. It's going to move around freely with the air that moves around in a room. So it really can be present at any elevation in the house. Why is carbon monoxide such a hazard? It's because it bonds with the hemoglobin in your blood and prevents it from absorbing oxygen. Now, that's really all the medical knowledge we need to know is that carbon monoxide prevents our blood from absorbing oxygen. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that that is a real health hazard. In fact, in 2018, carbon monoxide poisoning was the cause of 50,000 trips to the emergency room and over 400 people died because of it. So we have a direct ability as technicians and professionals to prevent these carbon monoxide poisoning incidents. You could be personally responsible for saving a life by educating a homeowner and by being there to prevent that equipment from causing that carbon monoxide fatality. So at what levels is carbon monoxide unsafe? Well, first of all, we need to understand that carbon monoxide is measured in parts per million. And even by that term, parts per million, we already can see that it probably doesn't take a very high concentration to be something that's unsafe. Well, you've got to be able to read carbon monoxide in parts per million. I always carry a personal carbon monoxide detector uh, or a, a monitor that I clip to my belt, and I monitor that as I'm walking through a space. So at the levels of one to nine, uh, parts per million, we're within the EPA and World Health Organization eight-hour limit, uh, but really anything above zero should get our attention. At one to nine, if you read that, what, what do you do? Well, it's best to advise the occupants of the presence of carbon monoxide, compare it with the outdoor levels, maybe in an urban setting, maybe that's what it is outside, but really it should not exceed nine outside. If it does, there are some serious problems with that outside air, and, and that may need to be addressed by, by more complicated solutions. Above nine to 35 parts per million, we definitely need to advise our occupant, and we want to invest, investigate the source, start looking at equipment that could be the source, because at 35, we have reached our NIOSH uh, organization's eight-hour limit. And so anything above that for an eight-hour period of time is definitely hazard, hazardous to our health. At 36 to 69 parts per million, 
we definitely need to advise the occupant. This is not normal. We should ventilate the, the building, open some windows, some doors, investigate the source, start looking for equipment that we suspect could be the cause, and then call the professional if it's not us that's supposed to be working on that equipment. And at 50 parts per million, we've now exceeded the OSHA eight hour limit. So we kind of see these organizations generally agree that from 35 to 50, that is not normal. An extended period of time that could be hazardous to our health. At 70 or above parts per million, we need to advise the occupant to immediately evacuate and call emergency services. Now, we may not have the authority to physically move them out of the building, but we need to strongly recommend that they do that. And then we need to remove ourselves from the building because above 70, that's where it gets really dangerous. At 200, NIOSH says a 15 minute limit and then it starts to seriously affect your health. You're gonna start noticing slight fatigue and headache. After two hours, it gets even worse. At 400, you're gonna have that headache, that nausea within a shorter period of time, 45 minutes. You could be unconscious and even die if you're exposed to it uh, for close to two hours. And then at 800 parts per minute, that is just very, very high concentrations and you could be dead in a couple of minutes. So it's important for you to understand those levels. Really anything over zero needs to get our attention. We need to investigate why, but as we get uh, around 35, that's when we need to start taking action. 70, that's really when we need to ventilate the building, get out, call emergency services, and anything above 70, we, that requires immediate decisive action. So don't be afraid to take that decisive action. Put yourself out there because you may be the only person that has the knowledge and the equipment to be able to make those decisions and save lives. Let's now talk about carbon monoxide detectors, the ones that we install inside a building. They are critical. We need to make sure that we're installing them on any building, even ones that don't have any fuel burning equipment in them. As we've learned in a previous slide, you could have a car that's idling in a garage. You could have uh, even a portable generator that's in there that could cause a carbon monoxide hazard. Most residential codes now require carbon monoxide detectors to be installed within 10 feet of any bedroom. Why a bedroom? Well, that's where people are asleep. They're not aware of any kind of carbon monoxide issues. For example, if they were awake, they would start experiencing nausea and headache and they would know that something's off. But when they're asleep, they may not ever detect that and they may never wake up. So that's why it's important to install them within 10 feet of bedrooms or in the bedrooms themselves. So as you service and install equipment, go around the house, talk to your homeowner, make sure that those are in place. Now, for years, commercial codes didn't generally require carbon monoxide detectors, but we're even starting to see them in corridors, mechanical rooms, and other places of assembly where they're important. So that makes us think, maybe we should start putting carbon monoxide detectors close to equipment that burns fuel so that that may be the first line of defense and have early detection of carbon monoxide. At least one low-level carbon monoxide detector should be installed in every building. What do we mean by a low-level carbon monoxide detector? That is one that very quickly detects and alerts in the presence of carbon monoxide. It's important for us to understand that not every carbon monoxide detector that we purchase is a low-level one. As we'll talk about in the next slides, the listing and the requirements for carbon monoxide detectors are actually not very safe. It's important to go the extra step and install a low-level carbon monoxide detector that will alert alert them a lot sooner than the ones that normally we find on the shelves will do. It's also important to realize that the little test button that you see on every carbon monoxide detector that you buy from the store, that button does not test that it's actually detecting carbon monoxide. It is simply telling you that the battery is not dead yet. Not all carbon monoxide detectors are the same. CO detectors fall under the UL listing 2034. And here's some information about UL 2034. This comes from coexperts.ca. They've got a great website, their organization that is dedicated to increasing education and knowledge about carbon monoxide hazards. Now, under UL 2034, that these carbon monoxide detectors are listed under, Notice at zero to 29 parts per million, the detector must remain silent. They're not even allowed to tell you that there is carbon monoxide present at those low levels. 
it must show a zero reading if it has a display. So this shows that just because you buy a carbon monoxide detector with a digital display does not make it a low level carbon monoxide detector. Now under the same UL listing at 30 to 69 parts per million, it needs to be able to remain at this range for a minimum of 30 days. That means that you could have 69 parts per million in your house for 30, 29 and a half days and that detector will not tell you that. Think about the health hazard that that could be, that that could represent to somebody, especially a baby or an elderly person, a pregnant woman, someone with those health uh, problems, those levels could prove dangerous. At 70 parts per million to 149 parts per million, that's when the alarm is allowed to sound, but that's only after it stayed in those levels from 60 to 240 minutes. If it drifts below 60, guess what? The time clock starts all over again. So you could have a situation where you're drifting in and out of around 70 to 80 parts per million up and down, and that detector may not even ever tell you. Take a look at the note below here. It talks about that time window of 60 to 240 minutes. 240 minutes is four hours. And again, that four hour clock can be reset if those levels drop slightly below 70 for just a moment and then come back, guess what? That four hour clock starts all over again. What do we learn about this? The box store carbon monoxide detectors are not good enough. You need to have a low level. It needs to say low level carbon monoxide detector on the box because this will alert you after one minute of a very low level, like maybe 25 parts per million, that's when it will alert you. And that is a kind of carbon monoxide detector that will save lives. This concludes lesson two in our combustion analysis training. Next time, lesson three will cover venting and draft testing. Thanks for watching. Leave some comments below, and as always, be safe.